And Serge Saxenoff uh, is my Vice President of Applications and Content. Um, he's a PhD from Stanford, which we don't hold against him most days. Um, and he was the scientific founder of 23andMe. So some of you may have known him from, from those days. So uh, without further ado, Serge. Thank you, Bill. This is a really exciting day. Uh, several years in the making, and uh, this is the conference where we're actually launching our product. Some of you have been by the booth, hopefully, you saw it's like the excitement that's generating. And uh, I feel really excited and really privileged to actually be here and being the one giving this talk and introducing the system. Uh, and hopefully at the end of it, you'll, uh, you'll see this as a radically new tool for doing nucleic acid quantification. Um, so the, the general overview of the talk is that I'll give a little bit of the quantal life introduction, uh, maybe a little more depth than what uh, Bill went into. Uh, then I'll talk about digital PCR in general, the concept, uh, what it means and how it works. And then I'll actually go through the details of the implementation, how digital PCR is implemented uh, in our platform using droplets. And I'll finish going through examples of the data, the kinds of data that we can generate with this instrument. Now, the system is actually built on about a decade's worth of research and development. As Bill mentioned, this started at Lawrence Livermore Labs where the initial concept um, came from his group, his large organization, uh, and centered around uh, doing PCR on really small droplets. And the team that he put together is really experienced at building and fielding instruments. So not just kind of basic research and development, but actually making instruments work in people's hands out there in the field. I came on board uh, fairly recently, and I'm kind of in a pretty unique and uh, fun position of uh, being sort of the first customer of this platform. My background is in bioinformatics, and uh, now that the platform is actually generating data, uh, I get to play with this toy and get to uh, look at the results. Um, and, uh, and so now we have a beta program in progress where we're working with customers, potential customers, where they're sending us uh, data and, we're, and samples, rather, and we're running them on our instruments and returning the data back to them. And uh, we're planning a launch sometime next year. And part of the reason we're here is actually to kind of start a dialogue and um, meet more people who would be interested in using this instrument for their applications, for their uh, projects. So, now going back to this original idea uh, that Bill had, which is uh, instead of doing a PCR in bulk, where you get one measurement from one test tube, you partition the sample into many, many tiny droplets each, each of which is a separate reactor where you have a separate, a different measurement done in each, each one of those droplets. Now, there are many directions you can take this in because there are lots of advantages to doing this, generally. Advantages to span sample prep, target enrichment, all kinds of things. But really, the, the most groundbreaking potential of this technology lies in digital PCR, which is where we took the company first, and which is the, this application that we're talking about here um, and which is what we're introducing here. We really see digital PCR as the third generation of PCR. The first generation was uh, when they first discovered the TAC um, polymerase, which allowed really the first instrument, first implementa practical implementation of, uh, of PCR. Now, in 96, um, well, so this first implementation was not very quantitative, obviously. You could do, you could sort of, uh, you can get your amplification, but you can't actually tell how much of your target you have in your sample. Then came, in 96 came the second generation, which is uh, kind of a clever chemistry trick where you monitor the reaction as it happens in real time. You monitor the buildup of your reagents and you can, of your product, and you can actually tell from that how much of your target you have there to begin with. Now, this works, but it has a lot of, uh, a lot of disadvantages. It's inherently imprecise, because what you're doing is you're trying to um, scale this, um, you're trying to map this really exponential function of your concentration, uh, which, which means that your error rate is going to be pretty high when you're trying to, to, do, to, to use it to estimate the concentration. Also, there's going to be huge variability from assay to assay. So those of you who work with real-time PCR know this. Uh, there's a limited, limit of detection. There's only so much of the target that real-time PCR can detect if you have a homologous background. 
And uh, those are the kinds of things that are gonna vary from lab to lab as well. So those scores aren't necessarily gonna translate from one instrument to another. And so what you end up having to do is uh, make a lot of dilutions, make a lot of standard curves, and then run your reaction and map it to a standard, standard curve to see where it maps relative to other curves uh, to, uh, to figure out the concentration. So digital PCR does away with all of that. And uh, you know, maybe perhaps I don't have the appropriate uh, historical perspective to speak about this with authority, about the different generations of PCR, but we have someone inside the company who, who's done this, who was actually at the core of the second generation of PCR, Mike Lucera, who actually started the real-time uh, technology and built up the business at ABI uh, back in 96 and made it into a huge success that real-time has been over the last 10 years. And he really sees that this is as much of a game changer as real-time was back in its day. There are many advantages to doing droplet digital PCR. Some of the key ones involve precision and accuracy. Fundamentally, it gives you much better precision, much better accuracy than anything else out there. It gives you absolute quantification. So again, you can do away with standard curves. You get a number out in the end that gives you the concentration, number of copies per unit volume. It also allows you, and this is a totally orthogonal application, allows you to detect rare targets in complex backgrounds. And I'll go into a particular application of this and how it ends up working in practice. Now, to give you an idea how this, how this actually works, it's very simple. There are three fundamental steps. First, you take your sample and you partition it into droplets. These droplets, uh, in our case, we do it into partition it into 20,000 droplets, all of which are exactly the same size. You then, you then thermocycle those droplets independently, so you run 20,000 different independent PCR reactions, each one in the droplet. And then the way it works is that some of the droplets will have, ha will have had your target in there and some will not. So the ones that have the target will end up getting amplified and those that don't have the target will end up not getting any amplification in it. So then you take those droplets and you stream them past the detector one by one and you read to see which ones had the amplification and which ones didn't. And that gives you a count of positive droplets and the negative droplets. The positive droplets are the ones that had the target and the negative ones that didn't. So, and it's pretty simple really. So this is, uh, this is another illustration of this. You start out with a field of droplets. Okay? Again, note, this is an actual picture. Note how they're all exactly the same size. Um, then you do PCR, and then some of them will end up being, uh, will, the, will end up fluorescing. Those are the ones that have the target in there to begin with. The fluorescence is actually photoshopped by me later, so uh, it doesn't quite look like that, green, but you get the point. Um, so, and then you count those partitions, the droplets that actually have something in them, right, the green fluorescence. And essentially, those are the partitions, those are the droplets that have the target, and depending on how you do the, you do the dilution uh, in the, before this, you can assume there's going to be one target per, per droplet. And so you count up those droplets, and that gives you the estimate of the concentration. So to give you an intuitive sense of what, what actually happens here, you start, the, here's a sample where you have low concentration. So, uh, you have two droplets that amplify. That essentially tells you that there are two, exactly two molecules in your system to begin with. This sample has a few more, so hence the concentration was a little higher in that sample. This sample has still a few more and this sample has a whole bunch. But notice there's still quite a few negatives and that allows you to estimate your concentration even though you end up getting a lot of, um, a lot of the time you'll get multiple copies of your target in a droplet. And uh, the way this works is that there's actually a direct relationship between the concentration and the number of positive droplets. You can model this as a Poisson process where in any given droplet you'll get zero, one, two, three copies. And uh, once you just work through the algebra to figure out how many droplets you expect with zero copies and how many droplets you expect with more than zero copies, you end up with this equation where the number of copies per droplet can be estimated as a minus log of one minus P, where P is the fraction of droplets that are positive. And so then when you actually plot, I don't know how many of you can see be below there, but you can plot the number of, uh, of targets, how many copies of your target you have, which is the concentration versus the number of positive droplets. As you increase your concentration, the number of positive droplets goes up. And note that early on, before you start saturating, 
your droplets, you actually have a very direct relationship, meaning for just about, it's very linear, meaning just for, for every positive droplet, for every, um, you get one copy of the target. So because you get any given droplet captures at most one copy of the target. And at some point, once you reach about um, roughly a few thousand copies of the target per 20,000 partitions, you start getting a bit of saturation, but that doesn't actually hurt you for uh, a long, long time. So this is, uh, this is the entire dynamic range of where you can actually estimate the concentration, how many copies per target. And uh, notice that this is on a log scale, and you can confidently estimate the number of uh, copies based on the number of positive droplets by looking at the number of positive droplets, the number you get, and then looking at the square and going down to estimate the concentration. And you can do this comfortably up to 50,000 or more targets uh, per 20,000 droplets. So a pretty, and that starts from zero to, to 50,000, so a pretty wide dynamic range. And another interesting point is that because this is a pretty well understood process, because it's just random sampling, essentially, you're throwing um, balls into urns, more or less, we actually understand the statistical nature of this process, and we can place pretty good confidence intervals around the estimates of this measurement. Um, so now, how is, how is this actually implemented in practice? Let me go through the details of, of how the instrument actually makes this work. Now, to make droplets, we provide, we provide an instrument, droplet generator. Some of you saw it yesterday. It's about the size of an iPad or so. Um, you take the idea where you take, uh, you take a sample, you put it into a cartridge, you load it into this droplet generator. You can do eight samples at a time. It generates the droplets. You take out the cartridge and does it about, um, at about 1,000 droplets a second. You take out the cartridge, you transfer the droplets into a 96-well plate, um, and you can do that several times. And then you put the 96-well plate into a thermocycler. Most of it, we figure that just about everyone out there has their own thermocycler, so we'll need to actually provide one. So we end up fitting around people's uh, workflows very nicely in that sense. So once you thermocycle it, you take out the, the plate and you put it into an optical reader which is really sort of like a flow cytometer, which picks up the droplets and shoots them past the detector and counts the positives and the negatives. Now, to go into more detail, a little bit more detail, um, the first step, and before you can do anything, you need to make a reagent mix. You take your primers probes, you take your Quantalife master mix, we supply this, quant, uh, this master mix, it's optimized for working the droplets, um, and you take your sample, you mix them, and you put them in, into this consumable, which is, uh, which is a single use only. This way, we prevent any kind of potential cross-contamination. And you can load up up to eight uh, samples at a time in this consumable. Now, once you load up the, the sample, you load up the oil, you put it in the droplet generator, this little box, and as I mentioned, generates, it now starts generating droplets by pushing, by applying vacuum, and um, this is an actual video, slow down, of course, of droplets being generated. I don't know how many of you guys, the guys, the people in the front are kind of lucky they can see this better. But uh, one of the things you can, uh, you can note here is that the droplets are all exactly the same size, and the size is controlled by the size of the, of the orifice through which the droplets get pushed. The oil comes in from the size, the aqueous comes in um, through the center over there, and the droplets get pitch, pinched over the rate of a thousand a second. And so after a few minutes, you actually have all of your uh, eight samples partitioned into droplets. Now. You take the cartridge and you can actually look at the droplets and kind of, it's kind of cool because it's this little milky liquid that comes out. And you take those droplets and you tra transfer them, as I mentioned, to a 96 well plate and you can use an eight-channel pipetter. And then you can generate, it takes, you know, because it takes only a few minutes to generate eight samples worth of droplets, remember it's 20,000 droplets per sample, so it's 160,000 droplets altogether. You can uh, go back and do this several times until you actually fill up a 96 well plate. It depends on how many samples you want to run at the same time. Then I put the 96 well plate into a thermocycler. Um, again, presuming everyone has their own thermocycler. And once you've uh, cycled the droplets and amplified whatever is in, in them, you load, you take out the plate and you load it into the uh, droplet reader. 
which as I mentioned is sort of like a flow cytometer. 